So um, maybe if we pull the mic this far away, it's a better sound level for people. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, last year when I started here at the museum in May 2022, the war was still quite young and um, uh, it, it was um, a time of when I think we were just getting the first, the second, maybe the second plane of folks from, from Ukraine coming over. I attended for the first time the annual general meeting of the Ukrainian Canadian Professional and Business Association. And there was a special guest speaker there that night, and that was uh, Vladimir Tanovsky. And uh, Vladimir is an agricultural economist um, he, uh, from Malikopol originally, and has been based in Odessa for some time with his family. And he spoke briefly about the um, his experience of the first uh, moments of the of the war, and then about the effects of um, the war on Ukrainian agriculture. And that's that's about nine months ago, and it was devastating already at that point. Um, I was struck by Vladimir speaking for a couple of reasons. Um, um, one, he's a very good speaker, but second, he he had he talked about having had an understanding that the war was coming and being prepared for it, where not everyone was. And we saw that in Canada as well, journalists who, who were not predicting the war. Very few people actually were predicting the war. Everyone thought it wouldn't happen. There were a few people saying this is going to happen, um, but but not everybody. And, and prior to coming here to the Ukrainian Museum of Canada, I was working as a researcher for four years at the Canadian Centre for the Study of Cooperatives. And um, my PhD supervisor actually was here in the room, uh, Dr. Murray Wilson. He, he's written a lot about about um, about cooperative and and one of the important things in cooperative governance is is having the right view of the future and how difficult that is for groups of people, let alone individuals, to to achieve. And I remember thinking when when um, Vlad was talking how it was so interesting that he had had the right view of the future when when so many people didn't at that time. But um, uh, most of us, I'm fourth generation Ukrainian Canadian, those of us who come from older generations of Ukrainians here, we have very strong ties to agriculture and farms. And of course, uh, Ukraine being the breadbasket of Europe, agriculture is, is the, the, um, you know, the, the driving force of their economy and, and important to the world, the whole world. So, um, it was uh, it was a really important talk, and this subject is very very important. So I'm really grateful to uh, to Vladimir for for joining us today and to give a, a longer presentation and and now one that's more than a year old um, on on the effects of of, uh, of the war on Ukrainian agriculture. So I'd like to welcome you to the podium. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased. And today, I will talk as well about uh, about some of the features, about uh, the story of the pictures. So, uh, my name is Vlad Tarnowski, and uh, I will tell you a little bit about my family, about our experience uh, already uh, in the scene of the war, uh, about the first day experience, and uh, some of my working experience. And, for the Ukraine, for the for agriculture in Ukraine. And first of all, I would like to start this uh, with this picture like Ukrainian farmer pulling out a tent, Russian tent from a field. And it was a real story when Ukrainian farmer took out some uh, Russian tent and it was uh, and he uh, or she took, took it up and pulled it to uh, prepare it and then return it back to. Uh, uh, and give it to uh, Ukrainian military forces. So, and there are a lot of stories of people, um, just not military people, they join together and help Ukrainian farmers to resist. Next slide, please. Well, before uh, 2014, now a little bit about my, my family. Uh, before 2014, I lived in Militopol, this uh, town is uh, right now, it, it is occupied. And I worked as an agricultural professor at the university and as well as a 
uh, extension service provider or agricultural uh, consultant. And uh, at those time, I started to work for uh, agricultural uh, development project or international technical assistance project. And part of this project was uh, sponsored by Canadian government uh, and it was aimed to help a uh, small Canadian agricultural producer to uh, to do better to uh, um, to develop their business uh, starting from supply chain and, and ending from uh, ending, ending by uh, by marketing marketing chain. So in 2014, I moved to uh, the second phase of this project started, and then I will be a little bit more on this project later on. So the second phase of the project started, and I moved here, this uh, small town of Kafoka here. It's really small, like 10,000 people. Lives there, or lives there uh, before the war. And I worked there for three years. And then our project developed, uh, our project started to develop new areas uh, in Odessa. And I was the one uh, of our staff who you know, started to work there to have some food on the ground and have a better feeling what is going on in Odessa region with small, medium horticultural producers. So the last three years before the project started, uh, our family lived in, in, uh, in Odessa. And uh, Odessa was one of uh, the many cities and towns uh, that was uh, hit by uh, rockets early morning on February 24th. And it was uh, uh, it was not damaged a lot as uh, you know other other places like Kharkiv, you know, like some in Mariupol region, especially in Kiev, it was, it was uh, numerous uh, of rockets. But still, uh, I woke up at five o'clock in the morning because of boost. I did not realize that it was explosions of rockets. I thought that oh, it's thunderstorm. No, it was full of gene. But uh, after some time, I realized that it's not high probability to have thunderstorm in February. And uh, you know, then I realized that it is, you know, it's the war started, and I woke up. My family is sports. Uh, wake up. The war started, and it was not like the best, uh, the best words that I, that you would like to wake up your family. Well, and as Jen told, I was ready for for such a situation. And uh, again, some stories I will tell you a little bit more about it. And uh, next slide, please. You can run. It's Okay. Yeah. Uh, a little bit about my native farm on YouTube, but it's some short video uh, from this town. From the very first uh, first days, uh, people, this town was occupied in the very first days, and the uh, Russian army uh, made a lot of efforts to occupy this uh, town in the very first days. Um, but still, you know, civilian people, when, uh, even when the Ukrainian army left the, uh, the, the town, uh, civilians, they still <laughs> continue to resist it but in a peaceful manner, you know, like they were trying to stop this uh, equipment, uh, like military, military equipment, you know, all these tanks and other stuff. And, uh, but after some time, you know, some people started to disappear uh, from the town and, you know, no one knew where they are. And in the same situation happened with the with this young guy. He's uh, in, uh, he's the mayor of Militopol, and he's my former student. So yeah, uh, yeah. So um, and um, and he was kidnapped probably in ten, in ten days after the war started because of his pro Ukrainian uh, pro Ukrainian position. He supported very well uh, his community during these first days. And after some time, he disappeared as uh, many other people were disappearing from the top, like active people, you know, with these Ukrainian flags, and they were protesting. And, but luckily, probably in two weeks after uh, he disappeared, he, he was traded on something. I believe it was some high rank uh, Russian military who was, uh, let's say, captured uh, from, the, from the very beginning of the war. And he came back, uh, but now he came back to his uh, to his work as a mayor of Militopol, and he works from Zaporizhia, and he still like supports um, people from Militopol, you know, keeping them informed what is going on. You know, I believe some uh, some partisan Ukrainian partisan Ukrainian spies they still work on the on these occupied territories and uh, help to resist uh, uh, Ukrainian armies. Yeah, well, and, uh, 
it is good. Uh, it is good to hear that most of Ryan really people still people who, uh, who who believe in Ukraine and who who believe that uh, Ukrainian army will fight back uh, this uh, this town. And I want to say honestly that there are some people in Melitopol who support Russian. And I hope that these people will, will disappear in the future with uh, Russian army. They will they will go out from the from the meeting. And uh, yeah, next slide, please. Shift in minds. Uh, this what this was uh, this what happened with me and uh, happened with many with many people of Ukraine. Uh, again, want to be honest, uh, I didn't vote for Zelensky as uh, I just didn't trust him. You know, he is uh, he's a comedian and he made a pretty good and funny movie uh, where he played the role of good president with no corruption. Uh, pretty honest. And he built his election campaign on this movie. You know, people trusted in the movie. And in those time, in election period of time, we had such an expression if you vote for Zelensky, why don't you go to Dr. House for medical assistance? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was uh, it was kind of a joke, but let's still you know people vote 75% uh, voted for Zelensky, and it's fine, you know, he started to work, and still there was some complaints. Uh, each, each, each president has uh, the same complaints and uh, shift in minds of people um, appeared when in the first days of war, uh, Zelensky was offered by um, by Biden, uh, American president, uh, to evacuate Zelensky and his family out of Ukraine. And Zelensky answered, uh, I need ammunition on the right. Like it was very powerful signal to all Ukrainians that his leader, uh, that Ukrainian leader is here and he will stay here till the end. And as well, at the first, at the very first days, the very first days, Russian propaganda did a lot to ensure people in Ukraine that this is Zelensky is out of Ukraine. And um, as his answer for this, every day he made such like small video uh, online video from uh, uh, from states in Kiev, like and he was telling, "I'm here. I did not disappear. Uh, my team is here, and we will fight fight till the end." So this was like I believe a, a key point in uh, in people's mind that the uh, Ukrainian nation nation has a leader, and we will fight till the end. In the very first days, uh, volunteers uh, did a lot uh, to support civilians and military people. And uh, from the very beginning, uh, first of all, it was let me read this. It was organized uh, self uh, self organized territorial defense uh, communities. It was like situation that people just gathered together and they got uh, and they got. Uh, some military equipment, some guns, you know, machine guns, something similar like this woman got. Uh, and uh, they got it to fight with Russians. And it was like during the first days of the war in Kyiv, um, people got approximately 10,000 uh, guns just on the streets of Kyiv. And then they went to fight with Russians. And this is one of the reasons why Kyiv still Ukrainian. And as well, uh, many people helped to uh, military people. I mean, many civilians helped to military people to organize such type of uh, block posts or checkpoints. And together with military people, they controlled uh, streets of uh, in Ukraine, looking for Russian spies. Uh, spies, yes, and they caught a lot of such, you know, such such Russian Russian agents. And it really, again, it, it helped a lot to. Uh, to resist at the very beginning of the war. As well, they organized sources uh, of donation, of donations, and they uh, spread these donations among, uh, among military, militaries and among uh, civilian people. For militaries, they organized, uh, you know, like fundraising to buy, um, uh, to buy some military equipment, you know, and for, for civilians, like, something. Yeah, and so, 
uh, and I believe volunteers they played a great role. Uh, even in, in the very beginning, you know, we're talking right now about um, uh, 2022, but actually the war for Ukrainians started in 2014. Yeah, so and in both, on both stages of this war, uh, volunteers played play a great role, and I know that many of you volunteer to help Ukraine, and I would like to thank you for this, because you all volunteers, you know, like you all help Ukraine, and thank you very big thank you for this. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, first days of uh, Russia full scale invasion. By the way, in Ukrainian grammar rules, uh, we proved that we could write Russia from smaller. Not like that. <laughs> so I encourage you to do the same. And uh, uh, well, uh, during, during the first, uh, first days of uh, full scale invasion, uh, people were looking for fuel and uh, fuel and some for, for medical stuff because they did not know if they will get it in the nearest future. So they drive up huge lines for gas and fuel station, for, um, for, for pharmacy shops, and for, uh, for shops, wine. for supermarkets. Wine stores. But, yeah, yeah, sure, wine stores. <laughs> It's just really important to get out of stress. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, there are a lot of people, and uh, no, as, as I told, uh, and uh, Jim mentioned that I had to say it, but I was right and, uh, that the work would start. And suddenly, from in, in this day, uh, some, some people who yesterday were considered paranoid became prophets. You know, I don't know why, I just had feeling I was reading articles and I was reading like. Uh, Ukrainian articles, Ukrainian news, and Russian news, and I came to the conclusion that the war will start at the end of uh, 2021. And starting from this time, I started just to, uh, I bought a, a canister uh, with fuel, and it was always in my uh, trunk, and uh, my fuel tank in, in my car was always full, and I bought dry food, canned food, and you know, like this. Uh, to restart to cook a food on a natural gas at home, to call it in English. So uh, I was basically ready for this. All our documents, uh, you know, all, all our papers were in certain places, and we knew what to do. I had this plan, and I discussed this plan with my wife, but still, it was terrible. We were, we were ready for this, but we were scared. And I could not imagine the way people on the front line were scared when they heard this explosion was really close to him. When you know the apartment, the people, uh, the building started to explode. It's close. And yeah, so and early morning, uh, yeah, next time. So early morning, we started our trip from Odessa to Moldova, and we stay we stayed for several nights in uh, Kishinev, uh, which is now in in. in uh, Although in which, uh, in the capital of, uh, of Moldova, we stayed there and we were, you know, trying to organize ourselves and think what to do next. We stayed in the place, uh, it was kind of hostel that was uh, uh, really fast organized by, uh, by people from Moldova. And it was like hostel that was something like room the size like this room uh, with a lot of matrasses on the floor. And so we were happy to get this place, and they provided for us hot food, water, and a place to live. And it was really great support. And after some days, we decided uh, we decided to go further. We uh, moved to Munich, and uh, my roommate uh, lives there. So her family hosted us for next two months. We stayed with them, and during this time, I started to work on. Uh, on my uh, visa application and my kids' uh, visa application uh, to Canada. My wife had a uh, Canadian visa um, from our uh, past trip to Canada, and mine uh, was expired. So I worked for visas, and you know, I already applied for visas uh, for, for visas. And uh, after that, the special program uh, for Ukrainians was open. So I applied on March uh, 14, and this program was open from. Program on March 18th, so they 
some type of model on which the model is based. So, and then at the end, uh, not in the end, in the middle of April, uh, we arrived uh, in, in uh, Toronto, where we stayed with five of our relatives. And they live there in Toronto, and uh, we got uh, seed number of the bank account, just started to organize our life, and we still were thinking about where to go. And Saskatoon was one of the places where we decided to go because I visited this town and I visited this museum in uh, 2006. Uh, I came here to report about the joint project that we had uh, with, uh, uh, with Saskatchewan Trade and Part, uh, Partnership Organization. And I believe the uh, University of Saskatchewan was as well uh, part of, uh, of this program. So I came here to, uh, to report about what we did in the trade. And I, and I believe this played some kind of role uh, in the influence of my decision uh, why we um, decided to come here. Next slide, please. And now you see this live map of uh, the way Ukraine was occupied, and then our um, military forces uh, gave it back to Russia through some, you know. They occupied territories, and uh, it was like great to watch the news to hear that some of our territories are getting back. Could you please keep it back and forth again to see the issue? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, but still, you know, like very sad numbers, it's especially number of uh, civilians killed, like 21,000 civilians are killed, and 487. Children killed, and number of wounded people, and uh, 10 million people left Ukraine, and uh, we have about 7 million people internally displaced, displaced mm, people who moved from the front line to, to, to other parts of, uh, of Ukraine. And Ukraine lost 35% of its GDP, and as well, $60 billion dollars, uh, United States dollars. It is uh, amount of um, damage or damage to infrastructure. And now we are getting to agriculture, so the direct losses of agriculture, of agricultural assets, grossing the set for uh, $34 billion. Next slide, please. Some historical facts of, about Japan, and it is very important to, um, to talk about it because in Putin's speech two days before he started. The war, he told that Ukraine is an artificially created country and it was created by Lenin in 1917. And it is not true because Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, was founded in the 5th century. In the 10th century, uh, Kiev was, was baptized. Moscow appeared in the 11th century and it was founded by, by the Prince of Kiev. Rus. And as well, like first fights for independence started in 18th century when Catherine's degrees or Catherine, uh, Catherine II uh, just eliminated Cossacks. Cossacks, these are warriors who lived in Zaporozhia region. And uh, in 1991, Ukraine got its independence when after the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, in 1994, it was signed the Budapest uh, Memorandum. If you heard about this, 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 this is the picture of signing this memorandum. Uh, it was signed between three countries, Ukraine, Russia, and the United States. And Russia and the United States, they promised that they recognized uh, Ukrainian borders and they promised that they, they will keep their, you know, the same borders, you know, and recognize uh, Ukrainian countries. But who cares, you know, like Russia, and Russia does what it would want to do. And uh, as I told you, the war for Ukraine started in 2014 with the annexation of uh, Crimea and uh, occupation of uh, some Western, Western territories, so Eastern territories of Ukraine. And so this is very short history uh, course on Ukraine. If you, if you would like to, to know more, it's very good uh, professor of Yale University, Timothy uh, Schneider, and he tells a lot about you know, history of Ukraine, the way it was organized, 
the way it was appeared, and it's about this constant fight between Russia and Ukraine. Some other facts about history. So, 1970 revolution, and uh, many Ukrainian farmers they lost their property and they were gathered together in, in collective farms. And, uh, and in 1932-33, it was artificial salvation. Millions of people, you know, millions of Ukrainians, uh, millions of Ukrainians died uh, because of hunger. And I remember the story my grandfather told me. Uh, that his family uh, was lucky uh, to hide some basket of it was kidney beans or some grains. Uh, so and they were lucky and they survived because they ate like all winter the same the same type of food every day. And luckily they survived and I'm here. And this is like yeah, just in 2022, some pictures of food. Shed. Yeah, next one, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and getting back to agriculture. Uh, so, uh, Ukrainian territory is approximately the size of Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan is uh, 50,000 kilometers bigger than Ukraine. So, it's approximately the same, uh, same territory in comparison with the United States. Right? Okay, and uh, total uh, area of lands in Ukraine is about like 20, uh, 28 million uh, of hectares or 70 million of acres. And uh, Ukraine holds 6% uh, uh, of world's uh, uh, black soils and 44% of Ukraine is uh, business soil. Uh, Ukrainian agricultural industry can feed up to 600 million people. And uh, next, uh, uh, fact that 56 percent of Ukrainians own farmland, and this will change after the war because right before the war, uh, I believe a year before the war, it was approved uh, the law that allows uh, Ukrainians to sell and buy land. Before that, it was restricted from the very beginning uh, you know, when Ukraine got its independence in 1991. So, and after that, it will be changed. And I believe this uh, this share will be on uh, will decrease. Next slide, please. So right now, twenty percent of Ukraine, uh, twenty percent of Ukraine is occupied. You can see this area. It's a little bit old part that this this uh, this city is already built, occupied, but still, like we're talking about agricultural lands, thirty percent is not under production in. 2022, and it will be not in the in this uh, in this season in this agriculture season. Next. Well, some other facts: uh, agricultural corporations in Ukraine hold 20% uh, of land, and private farmers uh, uh, from 45 to 50%, and small medium like family farms, approximately 30%, or again, closer to 30% of arable uh, lands. And it's very next slide. And uh, small and medium farmers, like family farmers, they are very important to Ukraine because uh, the total share of produce that they produce on their lands is pretty pretty significant. Like seventy percent of uh, agricultural produce, sixty percent of dairy, some grains, and ninety percent potatoes. So, yeah, it's it's pretty significant. They play a great role. And probably that is not probably that is one of the reasons why the uh, Canadian government decided to start this uh, program to support horticultural producers. And this program started in uh, in uh, 2008. Yeah. Next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, because like Ukraine is a cultural country, and before the war, it uh, in, uh, it had pretty pretty good position uh, in uh, global production. It was uh, number one in sunflower seed production, six in uh, corn and barley, seven in rape seed, and uh, ninth in wheat and soybean. Well, and of course, we need to sell it somewhere and sell it somehow. And before the war, we had a number of ports uh, that are, some of them right now are occupied. So this is basically already military, uh, military zone. And it's, uh, Occupied by Russian, and this port 
this course uh, do not operate. I believe work in Nikolaev started to operate recently, and this course uh, operate right now, and they operate next time. They operate due to uh, grain initiatives that was signed uh, last summer, and, and this allowed uh, to export securely uh, grain uh, and other stuff from Ukraine, and it helped a lot, you know, like to get some some money for our agricultural producers and for Ukrainian budget, because as you heard, uh, Ukraine lost thirty five of its GDP, and it's you know such such initiative very helpful, and it is always like a trade point for Russia. Russia is always trying to scare Ukraine. Uh, we will close this initiative. You know, we, 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 will, we will not continue this. So it's always some kind of negotiation about it. But again, due to this initiative, uh, you know, just for October 30, uh, Ukraine was able to export about 10 million tons of uh, 10 million tons, 10 million tons of basically crunchy crops. Yeah, and some some interesting fact. Probably you heard about Big Max, uh, Big Max index. Did, did you? Yeah. No. <laughs> so it's kind of a measurement system for for, uh, for community community's well-being because Big Mac it is pretty the same uh, has the same ingredients in all countries, you know. Like and uh, comparing this uh, Big Mac index. Uh, people uh, get like economies, they get to know um, well being of people. Uh, if the currency rate of uh, local currency is fair, uh, you know, regarding to other currencies and so on. So it's pretty um, such kind of index that, uh, that's used globally. And uh, in Ukraine, they have our own measurement system <laughs> and they call watch that. You, you all know watch that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it means like when you talk about watch that, uh, it means like that uh, how many some certain ingredients you need to uh, you need to buy and what the price of these in, in, ingredients. So you need to cook three liters of uh, uh, three liters of watch. So it, it includes uh, it's bread, sour cream, cabbage, potato, carrot, onion, sugar beet, tomato, grapes, and sunflower oil. And very often you. Here in Ukrainian news, like watch that goes up or goes down, like basically it goes up. Next slide, please. Yeah, some challenges for Ukrainian farmers that you are during last criticism and this criticism for sure will be. It's, uh, Constant sharing, sharing of mice, shortage of labor, people migrated, uh, shortage of inputs because some companies they just, uh, you know, like they do not export anymore, uh, like some fertilizers and goods, or they uh, not, not export, we do not import some fertilizers and other stuff that is needed for agricultural production. And those that are imported, the price for, for these inputs are really high. Like it's, uh, here is number. Uh, these numbers are in a price increase uh, comparing with the uh, with the season <coughs> so you see it's really significant and it's pretty challenge for farmers and here you can see what some farmers harvesting from their field with the help of uh, you know with the help of millers yes already uh, you know people Getting used to it, unfortunately, you know, they continue to they continue to work, they continue to break. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So and already right now, having the situation, the current situation with the occupied territories, Ukraine needs to inspect a uh, minimum uh, 270,000 square kilometers of its lands for mines and for other stuff for leftovers. In, in the fields, and it's like uh, comparing with the territory of the uh, of New Zealand, it's pretty the same size. So, yeah, and here are some figures about uh, about uh, harvest that we got in uh, uh, 2022 comparing with uh, 2021. We see here pretty significant decrease 
and uh, in production of many many types of crops and the process is because of such type of mines you know this flying uh, flying jets or the fields and process it brings some challenges to harvest it next slide but biggest uh, biggest damage uh, was done by uh, by the bombs uh, it ruined uh, agricultural infrastructure it ruined agricultural fields and you know equipment it uh, destroyed uh, uh, storages storage capacities where stored grain or other agricultural you know, products that was harvested in previous season so it's really you know like terrible situation next next time and this is one of the uh, comparing with the picture that uh, that is on the map that uh, Russian militaries they used uh, flame bomb, is right, like flame bomb bombs to burn winter crops, and they did it on purpose. And and it's uh, if you talk about genocide uh, in the nineteen thirty two. In 1933, it was like the second attempt, I would say, to kill Ukrainians. Just to kill them all, just burn their fields because they're jealous of the kind of one. Thank you. And uh, this again, like picture of damaged, uh, uh, damaged lands, uh, damaged soils. And uh, beside uh, these damages, beside these holes, that brings uh, that uh, bring a lot of challenges to farmers, you know, to work on the fields. Uh, it's uh, how to overcome this. It's not just to put, you know, some 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 soil on the top of this. Obviously, you need to clean up because because of the explosions, some harmful substances are in the soils in each part. And need, you need somehow to extract it or to wait for some time until it disappears. And only after that, you can see, you can harvest it from these fields. And it is really a huge challenge. So, you know, like almost uh, 75,000 acres happened because of these uh, shells, because of explosions, because of dirt military equipment, and all you know, these other, other war reasons. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, it's again the picture of the story farm. Yeah, in the way, <coughs> yeah, yeah, uh, like now, you know, about, about the about projects that I'm working on together with like minded people. Uh, we are working right now on the, on the project uh, post war uh, soil safety and security restoring. And we will do this project with the help of donor organizations, with the help of, uh, I know, uh, with of private people, you know, like uh, who, who will donate to this project. The idea of this project is to put a map uh, all holes, like from to do this with the help of satellite, uh, you know, satellite technologies or more technologies, and just to put everything on maps, and then to test holes uh, to identify what kind of uh, Harmful substances are in these holes, and then we will go to, uh, to agronomists to ask them what should we do with this in order to uh, get back uh, its safety and utility, and to develop some kind of methodological recommendations for farmers what to do with such holes, with such explosion, depending on the type of hole they have, depending on the type of bomb uh, that was used on this uh, on, on soils. So, and uh, yeah, we started to do this recently. Next slide. And as well, we work on the, uh, we work to help uh, people to restore their buildings if it is possible to restore. Next slide. Because some of them it is just impossible and you need to build something new. And it is terrible, you know, like I know such people who lost their houses and they moved and moved you know, to elsewhere, you know, they live with family members. Other countries. Thanks. So yeah, we are trying to help. Of course, it is not enough, you know, to only uh, and not, not only we uh, we are working on this, but many other organizations and we will manage to uh, to engage uh, 
and to fundraise approximately sixty thousand uh, dollars. And in the nearest time, um, there is some big uh, company in Ukraine that is willing to donate two hundred thousand dollars. I hope that you will approve this decision, and we will have you know possibility to to continue our help to such people, and as well we. Uh, continue beside civilians to help as well to military people to uh, you know, to fundraise and to fundraise for very very important right now for them roles because they need to have an eye to see you know, to see what is going on in, in Russian Russian's positions. Next slide. Yes. <laughs> this video from a Yiddish where the people. Uh, the, the left is English. And it's written here on the top. The life was here. And no one knows if people will get back to their houses after some time, after the war, or if they you know, have reason in their life. Yeah, and uh, this is a description of the project that we do. Uh, we called it Vault uh, to the Field to Roll Ukraine, and we do this together with Association of Veterans and Agribusiness. And I will tell you a little bit more, bit more about this organization in the next slide. So, just description. And now, uh, I would like to emphasize this is, this is uh, one of the results uh, that we got as a, uh, during the talk of the Ukraine horticulture business development project that was funded by Canadian government. It was co-funded by Mennonite Economic Development Associates. And they have headquarters in Waterloo, Ontario. And uh, they worked in Ukraine for 12 years, for 14 years, and I worked for this project for 12 years. And uh, as I told, the aim was help to small and medium farmers to to do better in their business. Um, and uh, in 2018, after uh, like we started to work with such people, and we found that amongst uh, among those people, there are some veterans, uh, veterans who uh, veterans after their first phase of the war, we said, like 2014. And these veterans, they have a privilege to get uh, two hectares of land for free from government, from state. And uh, many of them, they just uh, sold it right away. They sold it because of several reasons. First reason, they didn't find it. Second reason, they did not know what to do with this land. And we started to find that, that there are some groups for such veterans who bought uh, their land, but they do not know what to do, but they would like to do something. And we paid attention to one of the group in the uh, Nikolai region, the village of Nika, and uh, they were pretty, pretty inspired to meet us and to uh, got knowledge from, from our team, from, from the consultants that we hired to try to work with, uh, with small and medium producers. And uh, we helped to this uh, group of veterans to, um, to build their business and to uh, fundraise additional money to develop their business and they build uh, four greenhouses. They bought some equipment to work with this equipment. They organized a uh, place on their market to sell their products. And uh, I'm inviting you to see this uh, seven minute video about what was done. You can read here. Тому кооперативу, що 
dans le domicile. D'accord, on va voir que c'est. Mais là, ça n'a pas de quoi, je ne suis pas de quoi, je ne suis pas de quoi. Je ne suis pas de quoi, 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 je ne suis pas de Ще врожай, що ми використовували, це було 200 кілограм репетису, вирощували без добрив та засобів захисту рослин. Розійшовся в майже за 10 днів цього сезону, наші доманіці зможуть скуштувати наші помідори, помірочки, кабачки, зелень, капусту. Нашому дитині є проблематично доставка, як ви кажете, власних овочів, так і це питання для нас, що все завізне. І ми можемо сказати, що ви дуже овочі, не хочете бути овочі, а ви хочете знати, що це бачить, ну, на хвилі, на хвилі, на хвилі. І найважливіше, звичайно, це навчання. Ми навіть рекомендували раду постатковий експорт, який існує з відео, але не вірю, що не працювати, де коли ви вийшли все так. Без цього не буде нічого. Я навіть не можу ще якось таке скажу, але насправді так, на знання тут стоїть на першому місці. Відна змінила наших чоловіків, і в нас також. Можна возити на психологічну реабілітацію дуже багато разів, але це не має ніякого результату, якщо немає достойної роботи. Для ветерана, який повернувся за ток, дуже важливо зайняти своєю справою і розвиватися з кого системності. Ми розуміємо, що в нас є, ми вчимо з цим працювати, багато казавчу. Американська міна. Оце все, це українська міна. Найбільший місць. Взагалі, ви прийняли участь в цьому програмі, що ви говорили, для мене це збулася моя українська міна. І я думаю, тоді важливі для державного часу, це буде гарно йти на більші поверші. Ми
So, and uh, uh, when we implemented the first phase of such such a project for veterans, uh, as well in uh, in a year we did uh, we organized the five more groups of veterans, and we helped them to build property. And this video was made as a result on the example of, of, of the first cooperative, and it was made in 2021. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Like bullet points from uh, from this video. Uh, so you can go for psychological rehabilitation many times, but it gives no result if you do not have this important for veterans. Because many of them they have this post uh, post post syndrome or post uh, syndrome, and they have challenges with uh, alcohol, with drugs, you know, like it's uh, really too challenge for them. And if you give them something to do, they do this, and they more, um, let's say, this is, this is the way they could easily adapt to normal life. They come back from the war uh, to the civilian life, and it, it is a great challenge for them, and it's one of the uh, tools that could help hit them to overcome this challenge. And cooperative is uh, the organization form that could be easily accepted by veterans. Because there is uh, such um, um, such approach like equal to equal, when you start to talk with when veterans start to talk with other veterans on how to do the business and how to organize, they will accept it better. And so we already have very good examples of that that such kind of model works and it will be it will work. And another one that was really a challenge for us. Because veterans told us, don't don't teach us how to live, give us money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we will do ourselves, we are very clever. But uh, only after we started to work with them and started to teach uh, on how to do their business, you know, only after they visited a number of uh, seminars, webinars, number of experts uh, work with them, only after that they understood that they they knew nothing before they started to work with us, and they really recognized it. So, uh, such type of model uh, will work after the world war, and we will have more people uh, coming back from the war, and uh, they will have like it is potential for huge projects, and it's potential to help by such type of uh, projects to to other veterans who will get back from the war. Uh, next slide, please. And as a result, Stefan, in this movie, he mentioned that it was organized uh, association of veterans in agro business, and uh, we organized this NGO uh, in 20, 2021, I believe. And I have an honor to be a head of this organization, and I'm still head of this organization. And we help as we can to family members who still work with. Um, Pixel blocks, uh, pixel block in these cooperatives. Uh, you know, sometimes just they are asking advice what to do, you know, where to sell, how to uh, how to sell in such condition. And it just could be a phone talk, you know, it could be email or introduction of people who are working in Ukraine and who could help uh, to solve such issue, issues. And as well, together with this association, we help to uh, again maybe uh, fundraise for people who fight. Because all these people from this picture, the people that you saw, they are, uh, they could be some of them already, uh, right now on the front line, some of them they are volunteer or doing something like that to support, uh, to support our members. Okay, next slide. And 
Could it be switch or anything? Yeah, it's. She's uh, singing here Chirvona Kodina song. You probably heard about uh, the, uh, this song. Is it? No longer. <laughs> it's, it, 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 it should be somewhere here. Okay, Chirvona Kodina, just trust me. <laughs> you can, you can <laughs> see it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, and they sing this song in, in a corridor. Why? Because it happens during uh, air uh, alarm or air uh, like or this siren, yeah, the siren yeah. during the siren. And uh, our government, the Ukrainian government, uh, gave the recommendation that you need to hide between two walls, like external wall and an internal wall. And so that's why they they're here in the corridor and they're waiting until this. Uh, alarm will pour. And so we are pretty enthusiastic. And Karen says that we will never give up. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> yeah, we are too much, you know, like they are hardworking people. We, we have a goal, we will, we will reach this goal. And uh, probably this is it, what I wanted to say today. And I will be happy to answer your questions if you have. So please. You're welcome to, um, to discuss and to ask anything you want. Thank you so much. Do we do we have any questions? You know, I can pass around the mic. We we have a few people watching uh, from Zoom. Um, so if you have a question, I'd like to use the mic. We we should come here. <laughs> no, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, the the veterans that we were helping organize um, your greenhouse is that um, in where is that located? Is that in the in an area of the city right now? Uh, oh, oh, let's see. Yep. Is the switch on? Uh, yeah. Could you please switch on uh, this one? This one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it is a live region, it, it is somewhere here. Uh, this was this area was almost uh, occupied by Russians, but our military forces they were able to keep them back. So it is, uh, you know, like it is our area, and, and the government control, the Ukrainian government control area. And uh, they do their business, they still work in this green process. I'm happy, I'm happy to hear this and I'm happy to talk to them to keep them in the Okay. okay, the strength of the Roman army uh, came from the way they recruited their soldiers. Uh, that anybody that survived the war uh, got back to Rome to all get the farmland. That's sort of similar to. What's happening in Ukraine? Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, like really, it is important. It, it is kind of supporting the Ukrainian government. Uh, doesn't have money or to support the uh, support soldiers, the ex soldiers to support veterans and uh, providing them the land as a kind of you know, this little thank you for, for their growth that they give you know, to the defense advantages. It is kind of supports. But where did the land come from? Was it expropriated or? No, it's just government land. Okay. It's just government land, as I told you, um, uh, as I mentioned in the slides, it's like 56% uh, of uh, Ukrainian citizens own farmland. And you know, there is other types of land that, uh, that is reserved uh, by uh, local communities as a government land, you know. And so it would be no one's land just because you know the former owner um, is, is dead or lives where and it's just you know, and so there that is how government provided this land. So there, there is a lot of land on the government control land right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Another question about co-op. When I worked with students from Ukraine in the past. At the at the Center for the Study of Cooperatives, many have expressed a great deal of skepticism around the whole idea of 
co-ops, partly because of the Ukrainian experience of forced collectivization. So did the did the soldiers have any of the veterans have any of that skepticism? And 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 do you think that the co-op model will remain exclusively with with the veterans or or can there be a change? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, I'm, I'm totally agree because the uh, Ukrainians are pretty skeptical of the fossil uh, collectivization, like collective farms, you know, like, and we still have memory in our bones, like about these collective farms, and it's not good. And when we, when the first project, international project, the projects came to Ukraine with the idea to to, to build and to, to develop cooperatives, uh, it was like, okay, you are going to get us back again to collect farms and we don't want it because we just want to be, we just recently became free and now you want us to get back to properties. And it's really hard to explain to people. It was hard to explain, but due to the work of such, you know, like organization as a, like Mennonite, you know, Mennonite Economic Development Association, Economic Economic Development Associates, yeah. So, due to such organization, other implementers, of course, they act because they are that they, they would funding from the Canadian government, the government from the European Union, from the United States, and you know, and other ones. <laughs> People started more and more understand that the cooperatives is good. You know, you can you can work together and. Uh, I know uh, several people in Ukraine who works to adopt uh, uh, to recognize legislation system uh, for better support of cooperatives. And it started, long, I believe, like five years ago, this cooperative movement started uh, started to gain momentum, you know, and to develop more and more. And with veterans, it was pretty the same, but uh, from my experience, it was easier to talk to them, you know, because we see a group of people and they uh, they trust each other and they see the life in two colors, black and white, you know, and nothing else. Like veterans, they, they do so. And uh, uh, when we started talking about this, they thought, okay, we trust each other, no problem, you know, let's try this. Let, let's try this model if you could do so. A group of these veterans uh, should be brought over to uh, Canada to uh, look at the way the uh, farms uh, function here. Uh, that, that's the most efficient way of uh, farming. Right? Everybody in Saskatchewan can see that. Yeah, yeah. That's not true. No. That's <laughs> not true at all. <laughs> But this is a good idea, you know, to have this uh, networking uh, to bring people here to see uh, to see some other experience. Uh, with the growth of many farms in Ukraine, it's been based on a lot of foreign investment and a lot of large scale farms. Because what you're talking about, yes, there's many many agricultural lands. A lot of those are are rented out to large corporate farms with major investments from around the world. How has that affected those farms? Is investment still coming in? Uh, can you comment a bit about that? Yes, yeah, it's, it's true that there are some there are some huge amounts of investment from from the world, from other big corporations, agricultural corporations, other countries. It is just good, and uh, of course the war affected uh, affected the situation. And uh, but you know there are still. Uh, this farming preparation, if they own land on the government controlled territories, they continue to operate. They continue to grow to minimize their uh, loss. Because if they do nothing, they will uh, they will lose a lot of money. You know, just somehow they're trying to do this. And uh, it is harder to survive for small farmers. You know, because they don't have any other sources of financing, is only only what they got, only what they you know, like from, from their house because they they do things. And there is one of the threat uh, that uh, people see in uh, in this law that was adopted uh, like 
is, is a possible proof to sell them by lens because they're afraid that big corporations will go to the account and buy all the Ukrainian land. And there is, a, you know, I believe some reason for this, but still, uh, land as an asset should be, you know, should be in the market. This is my opinion. It has to be some sort of laws uh, approved by the Ukrainian government to avoid monopoly and to avoid it's just only big corporations coming to the own uh, Ukrainian goods. Well, oh no, we have one more question back. A little bit opposite to agriculture. I was looking for a comment on the whiskey's uh, negative impact on land that would be native species, wetlands, or that they had been filling in wetlands, aspen plus the flora. And are there plant ecologists, soil ecologists, water ecologists, etc., looking at this aspect of the deterioration of what is very necessary for biodiversity? Yes, that's right. Yeah, very, very good question. And it's not only you know, the work, the work, it's not only agriculture, it's not only with biodiversity as well. And, uh, I did not uh, hear a lot about if the if the government going to do something with this right now because first it's to restore edible lands and you know like to feed people to get some money for country and I believe there will be projects aimed to support this biodiversity and to work with uh, you know in in forests a lot of mines. A lot of explosions and as well as it must really as well as uh, wedding because of the uh, flora fauna and, 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 and this ecological ecological uh, issues. Yeah, and I hope it will be some project as well. It's good potential to do so, you know, good potential for the research in this field. It's a good area for people, for young people, for jobs, plant ecologists in Canada. Transfer, you know, they are looking for. I know where they work. Yeah, sure, they will. <laughs> they will win. <laughs> no doubt. Slava Ukrainian. Yeah. I, I think we'll wrap it up here. It's 2 30, and um, uh, I still have a few questions on Instagram. <laughs> Um, but I want to thank you all for coming today. I think if one thing became clear with the amount of work that's been going on, fundraising and um, uh, uh, generating awareness, raising awareness for the trouble that Ukraine is in right now, even after we've been in the war, that work is not going to stop. There's going to be so much even more need for raising of resources and activities on our end and in Ukraine and all around the world to, to help Ukraine recover from this devastation. Um, thank you, Vladimir, for your wonderful presentation. Um, and uh, thank you to all of you for coming today. Um, we are going to be hosting lots of talks over the next few years. If you don't have a membership, please consider taking out a membership at the front desk, and you'll get all of the information about our, our uh, programs and activities delivered to your inbox. Um, we have an opening coming up on Thursday, next Thursday. This show is coming down, and we have an installation called Doors Through the Horror of War, brought here by a young Ukrainian artist named Ruslan Kurt, and they are actual doors from three Ukrainian cities that have been damaged by the war, Kiev, uh, Sumy, and Kharkiv. And um, we have a show next door of, of uh, uh, SNK from our permanent collection. Um, but if you want to join us for our opening on Thursday night at 7 p.m., we'd love to see you. Um, thank you once again to the Love Ramp, Karen and UCC, and thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.